Thank you, Steve. A few years ago, Randy Alcorn wrote a book about giving and stewardship entitled The Treasure Principle. And one of the key passages in there that I thought was just fantastic said, when God provides more money, we often think this is a blessing. Well, yes, but it could be just as scriptural to think this is a test. Last week, we talked a little bit about first in ten giving, the principle that seems laid out uh, in, in scripture, talks about tithing and talks about giving to God first and giving our first tenth to the Lord. And when God commanded the Israelites to tithe and, and to give 10%, This was a test, and he's testing them to say, are you going to trust me? Are you going to allow me to provide for you? Or are you going to choose to be self-reliant, or are you going to be God-reliant? So this was the test that was put out. It was a test to see where their hearts were, not only with their finances, but also militarily in other ways as well. So this reminds me of a plot of one of my favorite stories growing up. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I don't know if you guys remember that. Originally, it was called Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. But if you remember, the whole story uh, revolves around this eccentric genius who has the world's most famous uh, candy factory. And and for years, he's been kind of secluded. And they've chained up all of the the gates. No one's allowed to go into the factory. And no one's been allowed to come out to, to keep the secrets safe within. Well, Wonka makes an announcement that he's putting five golden tickets into some of his chocolate bars. And so from around the world, people are are searching for these five golden tickets that will allow them access into this most famous chocolate factory. And so various kids find the tickets, and you remember some of them. You have Augustus Gloop and Violet Beauregard. You got Veruca Salt and Mike TV. And then a poor local boy named Charlie Bucket, receives the final and fifth ticket. Well, Wonka shows these these lucky recipients into his factory, and it's just incredible seeing some of the things, and all of the things are there for them to enjoy within his kingdom. And there are entire rooms that are made up of of candy, and even has a a chocolate river there. And what's interesting is, is the kids are given all sorts of freedoms and are able to, to sample and, and even break some of the grass off and to eat it and, and to sample all the wonderful things that he's provided within this kingdom. But one by one, each child is eliminated from the tour because of their greed. They want more than what Wonka is offering them. My, my favorite scene in the movie is when Veruca Salt is determined uh, to have one of these trained squirrels, and she's pushed down the garbage chute when it's determined that she was indeed a bad nut. And what's interesting is, by the very end of the, the tour, you have Charlie goes in, in a very touching scene with Willy Wonka, and he gives the eccentric owner the one thing that he was looking for. Charlie returns to him the everlasting gobstopper that he had been given. And because of that, Charlie inherits the whole kingdom. He gets the whole factory. All of it is given to him because he gave back a little bit of what had been so generously had been given to him. And see, Charlie was worthy of receiving more because he had the same heart as the owner. He understood. He connected with him. And so this was a test. A test for these recipients to see who exactly was in line with the owner who was going to be the next person to take over after Willy Wonka. And I got to thinking, that's kind of what our life is like. And we're given a tremendous amount of things to experience within God's kingdom. And each of us are given blessings. We're given riches and and monies and and promotions at, at work. But these are a test. And we have tests during the good times. If you remember back when uh, Joseph is in Egypt and they had the seven years of plenty. And so we go through those seven years of plenty and the time where we're experiencing life in, in high cotton. That's the test, how we'll handle that. But we're also given, sometimes, we're, we're given tests when things are not going well. They're in the seven years of famine. And, and there are times when we lose our jobs, when investments fall and when our pensions are wiped out, and sometimes we're just buried by medical uh, bills. 
how do we handle those times? Because those are a test as well. And so there, there's a lot that, that happens in our life spiritually that has to do with how we handle our finances and how we, we take care of the things that have been given to us. Do we have the right perspective on God's blessings? Well, first I'd like to tell you that I believe laid out in Scripture is the right perspective begins with the understanding that everything belongs to God. It's all His. Psalms 24 and verse 1 says this, The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world, and all who live in it. Everything that we see, all of us, we belong to the Lord. It's all His. Hebrews 2 and verse 10 says this, God, for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory. Well, both these verses that, that are recorded in the present tense, the, this wasn't long ago it, it was made for God. No, it's right now. Everything we experience is God's. Everything belongs to God and exists for God. And if we start seeing things in this way that exist for Him, then we also realize that God has been generous and He's given us a tremendous amount of things. And He doesn't demand that we as His servants live in poverty. We, we just don't see that. He, he doesn't resent us making purchases or, or reasonable expenditures on our behalf. But that giant truth remains that none of this really belongs to me. And so we start looking at, at life differently when, when we acknowledge that everything belongs to God. And, and that's our, our starting point. That God has created this. And yes, we experience His kingdom, but this kingdom belongs to Him. And we have been entrusted, not given, We've been entrusted with what God has blessed us with. That means I shouldn't be concerned with ownership, but each of us should be concerned with stewardship. Stewardship, not just to manage things, but to accomplish things that God wants with these resources to accomplish His purposes. So then it becomes incumbent upon us to find out what God would have us to do with our resources and what purposes He would have us to be about. This past week, Jesse Jackson Jr. made headlines when he confessed to siphoning more than $750,000 of campaign funds for his personal use. And what was interesting is, is they lay out on, on, on several articles some of the things that he spent the money on. Because three quarters of a million dollars, where did he spend the money on? Well, 43000 was on a gold Rolex, and he had 60000 in in tabs at, at various restaurants. $15,000, can you imagine going to Best Buy and spending $15,000 on, on flat screens and on DVDs alone? It's just incredible. $17,000 on tobacco products. $5,000, I thought this was a little weird, on a red and black cashmere cape. I don't know what he's going to use that for. And then he, he spent a lot of money on Bruce Lee and Michael Jackson memorabilia. And, and this one I actually get, uh, an Eddie Van Halen guitar. That was pretty cool. And Seven thousand dollars on two mounted elks. He didn't even shoot them; he just bought them. Uh, but most troubling to me on the list was three hundred dollars at Build a Bear workshop. I mean, how do you spend three hundred bucks at Build a Bear? But but he did. And after reading through the extensive list of these expenditures, the U.S. District Court asked Jackson for an explanation. Here's what he had to say: Sir, for years I lived off my campaign. I used monies that should have been used for campaign purposes. And I used them for myself personally to benefit me personally. And I'm acknowledged that that which the government has presented is accurate. And I, I think it's the, the, the same for us. We have to see that God has a campaign. And God has given us blessings. He's given us things that He wants us to use for campaign purposes. He's given us jobs. He's given us incomes and, and talents and responsibilities that go along with all these things. And He's given us opportunities. So everything that I've been given doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. I've been entrusted with it. I'm just a manager. And so we have to see things differently than the way the world sees things. I'm a steward. It's not me. And I'm here to advance His kingdom you know, in several places in the New Testament, it, it uses the analogy, we're, we're not used to it much because not many of us are, are farmers, but it uses the analogy of sowing seeds. 
And so the blessings that we have are reality, are, are these seeds that are designed to be cast and to be sown. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 10 to 11 says this, He who supplies the seed, that's God, to the sower, that's us, and, and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed, not just for enjoyment, but for sowing, for more sowing, and to increase the harvest, not just of our blessings, but of righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us produce thanksgiving in God. So God wants us to take the things that he gives it, and he wants us to do things that advance his kingdom, to make a difference, not just to say, thank you, God, I appreciate all this I'm bringing in. No, he wants us to multiply that and to advance it and to produce a harvest of righteousness. This world is desperately in need of people who are willing to use their resources that God has provided to make a difference, to truly change the course of history. You know, our blessings are like seed. And if, if we look at it in that way, a, a, a farmer can't take the seed and just sit there and eat them all day, nor can he store them away in his barn. Because if, if he does, what happens is he's not going he's gonna to starve. He's not going to have a harvest the following year. He has to use that seed. He has to let go of it. He has to cast the seed and scatter it in the field. Only then will he receive this harvest that has been promised. Only then will he receive more. I think sometimes we look at the, the mathematics of giving. And, and sometimes we look at it as just simple addition and subtraction. That, uh, you know, if, if we sow a seed, well then we have one less seed than what we had before we sow it. But a lot of plants, will, one seed will produce a thousand more seeds. And so we need to kind of use that analogy to help us to think that each dollar that we're presenting is going to help and provide so many other things that God can multiply the monies that are given to produce a harvest several times over what we can do. So we actually are not one dollar less, we're one dollar richer because of what God is going to do. Scripture tells us that God loves a cheerful giver, or he loves a cheerful sower. God loves the person who sees money for what it can be, sees it as an opportunity to leverage things, to leverage events, to leverage opportunities to advance God's kingdom. That's what he's asking us to do. Jesus used the analogy of the seed and the harvest again in the parable of the rich fool in Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. He told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. And he thought to himself, hey, what shall I do? I don't have a place to store all my crops. Then he said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger ones. There I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, <laughs> you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded of you, from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. Well, that's a harsh teaching. But God said, those things that I've been given, they're there for a purpose. They're not for you to lay aside and say, now I'm going to take it easy. God has given us these things for a reason. This poor farmer just doesn't get it. He thinks it's all about him. And so what does he do? He just quit and says, boy, I've got enough to live on for quite a long time. I'm going to sit down on the porch and just enjoy the fruit of my labor so he stops farming and starts using everything for himself for early and long retirement. But he forgets that the harvest was not from him. He forgets that the land is not his. He forgets that the time that the Lord has given him on this earth is not his. God says, I want you to use these things as resources and use them because all that you have, including your time, your efforts, your skills, your ability, all belongs to the Master. And he wants you to be using. Both his blessings in his life are not being used for the master. So the master says, I'm going to take that back from you. 
I'll pass it on like the parable of the talents to the one that's using the things I've given to multiply things for my kingdom. That's what he's asking them to do. Here's what he should have done. 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 through 19 says this. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. He doesn't want us to be paupers. He wants us to enjoy this life, but do it in a way that honors Him. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. That's what the farmer should have done. Instead of looking at what he could store in his barns to provide wealth, his wealth came, or should have come, from doing good. Doing good deeds. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. We're given such a short period of time on this earth. Just a, 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 a blip. It's just a vapor that comes and goes. So this is a test. It's what God wants us to do to see where our heart is. And what we do in this time that we're given and the resources that we're given lays a pattern and sets a course of what God wants to do. And so God's calling us in this test to use our resources not just for us, but to bless others and to do the things that God would have us to do to lay this foundation for His kingdom. And we can all be rich in, in good works. We have to see that, that God provides these opportunities if we're praying for them, for God to open these doors to us. And I, I don't know how much that, that you make and, and, and how much that you feel like that you have, but we're all blessed in this room. We are. God has given us a tremendous amount. And we've been blessed by God in so many different ways with the monies that we have and also the talents and the opportunities and the time and the connections that are unique to you. How will you use that? Will you use it to, to leverage it for your own benefit or use it to leverage it for God's kingdom? What do we do with these blessings? Because that's the question that each of us has to decide. You know, those blessings are meant to be seeds that God's given for each of us to be able to, in our own little gardens, to grow up a rich harvest for Him. That's what He's asking us to do, to give it away. Allow God to use us over and over to bring about His righteousness in, in what we're doing. You know, when we understand this and start looking at life in, in this way, then, then really we kind of flip the whole giving argument on its head. And, and instead of asking, well, how much of, of my money should I give to the Lord or, or give to the church or give to this work? It, it really then becomes, well, this is God's money, and these are kingdom funds that I've been entrusted. What's the least amount that I can live off of these kingdom funds to keep the rest of it leveraged for what God would wants to be doing with these? 69-year-old Albert Lexi from Manassas, Pennsylvania, started shining shoes when he was 14 years old. About age 30, he had the opportunity to go visit some friends whose child was in the Pittsburgh Children's Hospital. And as he saw what was happening there with, with different children and, and the treatment that they were receiving, he was immediately hooked. And he said, right then and there, he goes, I know I'm, I'm just a, a, a shoe shiner, but any tips that I give are going to go immediately back into this ministry. And that's when he dedicated himself. For the next 30 years, any tip that was put into his jar, which was over a third of his income, went straight into this. And over a 30-year period, he's given over $200,000 on his meager salary for the Children's Free Care Fund, which goes to help children whose families can't afford to give the treatment they need. This fund helps supply for that need. Well, in addition to giving this money twice a week, he's stopped working, and he hops on a bus, and he, he travels three hours round trip into Pittsburgh to go and spend time with these children, but also to set up his shoe shining business there in the lobby of, of the hospital. And so after he had done this for 30 years, Dr. Joe Carrillo, who heads up the staff at the hospital, said this of Albert's work at a press conference. He said he's really one of Pittsburgh's finest, a great role model for anyone. He has given up one-third of his income, all of his working life, for the children. 
for Albert's kids. He does it with his whole heart. As we wrap up this this series on stewardship, the last thing that I want to do for anyone in this audience and part of the Trickenham family is to heap guilt upon you. If you remember our lesson we did two weeks ago, guilt or have-to giving is kind of the lowest on, on the food chain. What I'm interested in is your heart. I'm interested in us as disciples completely giving ourselves over to the Lord. And I, I know that money and, and how we handle that can either draw us closer to God or it can cause us to take a step back. Because the Lord said that you can't serve both Him and money. And it's, it's tough. And so th- this morning, if you're interested in, in talking further about the spiritual nature of stewardship, I'm available throughout the week, and so is our staff, and our, our shepherd's going to be right out here. If you'd like to talk about some of the spiritual aspects of giving and what's going on. But if, for others, if, if your heart's already there, but I, I'm just looking at my balance sheet and my checkbook, and it, it's just not, the, I, I have a desire, I just can't do it right now, I, I encourage you to get a hold of some of our folks that have set aside their time to help people to align their finances. Guys like Tom Brown and Scott Martin and Bonnie Liphart and Mike Johnson and Cabot Cooper. They're all there to help you to make it happen and to, to help you with your financial aspects of your life. You know, Scripture makes it clear that we can't be right with God and wrong with our money. We've got to get this right. It's part of discipleship. As Charlie Bucket was worthy because he had a heart that was aligned with the owner of the, of the chocolate factory, I pray that we can begin to align our heart with God, that we can see the purposes of His kingdom. We can see how important it is to take the blessings that we've been given and use them as seeds to advance his cause of righteousness. May we be generous as our Heavenly Father has been generous with us. This is only a test, and I pray that we